guess I will take it away. I love the enthusiastic crowd. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for all of you for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Karen. I manage this branch Woo! library, yes. Uh, we're excited to have the League of Women Voters, Santa Monica, here, and um, our wonderful author standing over there, Angelica Carpenter, talking about this wonderful woman, Matilda Jocelyn Gage. Uh, we're also happy to have our council person, Greg Marina, who's a direct descendant of this wonderful woman. <laughs> um, and we're also excited to have CDTV filming us today. <laughs> we all got to be interviewed. It was all very exciting. So um, it's, this is really, um, besides the fact that this is an exciting topic for, for all of us, especially as a woman, um, it's, it's great. It's very timely. Uh, I don't know if you know, but next month, March, is Women's History Month. So we're also going to be having a lot of programs in the library celebrating women. Yay! Um, and also, it's you know the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote, uh, the 19th Amendment. I was I was looking that up. August 26th this summer will be uh, 100 years. Which, believe it or not, this library is even older than that. This library is an original Carnegie Library, and it uh, is about 102 years old. It just turned 100 a couple a uh, couple years ago. Time does fly, so uh, it's very exciting stuff. This this room is actually an original room. It used to be a librarian's desk right here. And uh, we have old photos. And I always feel like there's kind of ghosts in this room of you know librarians and, and kids from the past. This was also a teen library, a kids library of great pictures. And our, our, we have a photo archive online. You can see on our library's website with all those great pictures. So it's a really fun period of time. Uh, just a couple little housekeeping things. Uh, we have some um, wonderful cookies at the league brought for us. Feel free to step up and get some. Don't be shy about that. Just try not to probably trip or do anything like that. Water, restrooms are right outside the door. Emergency exit is right behind there. You basically just follow me out that door. <laughs> and there's also an emergency exit around the corner too, same kind of thing. Uh, I think that's about it for me. Uh, you know, do you, um, you, all of you probably come to a lot of our programs, but do you kind of, kind of pay attention to our calendar? We have a print calendar that comes out every month with all our programs. We also have an online calendar. So you can find all the great stuff that the library is doing uh, in this calendar. We have all kinds of programs that are all free. Uh, we have all kinds of um, uh, book groups here at the library, fiction winners book group, regular book group, mystery book group that I ever see. And uh, we have all kinds of wonderful books, such as this one here. Um, and there's also, importantly, we're going to be having sales after the program. Um, and you actually can get an autograph from the author. So that's going to be OK, so I think I'm going to have the League of Women Voters take it away here. Natalia, yes, our president of the League of Women Voters, is going to be doing a Hi. little intro. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you all for being here this evening. Um, so my name's Natalia Zernitskaya. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask any of you to pronounce it. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Santa Monica. So for anybody who doesn't know, uh, the League of Women Voters is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, nearly 100-year-old organization dedicated to voter empowerment. We empower voters in two ways, through education and through advocacy. So we never support or oppose any candidates or political parties. So our education side provides nonpartisan voter resources, such as unbiased pros and cons presentations on ballot measures. We have a few people who present on them here today with us. So you know, if you need any help, I'll, I'll point them out to you. Um, and we also do voter registration. And one of my favorite tools that we help provide is votersedge.org. If you need assistance with your ballot, if you're trying to figure out where do I get information, votersedge.org. <laughs> Let me just say that again, votersedge.org. Write it down for yourself or just remember it. Um, and on the advocacy side, we advocate for best practices on many issues such as the environment, education, my favorite one, housing and homelessness, <laughs> and a lot more. And when I say that the league is nearly 100 years old, it's because tomorrow is our birthday. <laughs> so we're turning 100 tomorrow. Woo! Thank you. Um, so the Santa Monica League has a bunch of events uh, coming up very soon that we would love to see you all at if you're able to attend. On March 2nd, we are screening Uncivil War, which is a documentary in partnership with the Bertelman Foundation and the League of Motors at, of Los Angeles at the Lemley in Santa Monica. 
March 5th, we have our post-election day happy hour at Solidarity. March 21st, uh, we have a Discovering the History event at the Santa Monica History Museum. And on March 26th, we have our annual Women Who Shape Santa Monica celebration. And this year, we're honoring three fabulous women in the Santa Monica community, Karen Gunn, Katherine Baxter, and Vivian Rothstein. And now, for the reason we're all here. I know, you're like, why are we here? What are we doing in this room? What's this slide up on the screen? So we're all here today to learn about Matilda Jocelyn Gage, a radical suffragist. Um, after her death, she was all but written out of history, but one person did not forget her, her son-in-law, L. Frank Baum, who, who was best known for writing The Wizard of Oz. Anybody ever heard of that? <laughs> Wizard of Oz, anybody? No? Um, so Angelica Carpenter, right here, literally wrote the book on Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and you can purchase your copy after the event. <laughs> So Ms. Carpenter is the curator, uh, curator emerita of the Arnie Nixon Center for the Study of Children's Literature at CSU Fresno. And she's written several middle grade biographies in addition to born criminal Matilda Jocelyn Gage, a radical suffragist. She's a past president of the International Wizard of Oz Club and a member of many organizations, mm -hmm. including the American Library Association, very appropriate, and the League of Women Voters. <laughs> And we're also very lucky to have Councilmember Greg Moreno with us here this evening. He's a lifelong Santa Monica resident, and this is his second year on City Council. Congratulations. So he and his wife, Uni, uh, run their 41-year-old local family business, the Albright, on the Santa Monica Pier, which was actually the first green certified business on the pier. And in addition to serving on council, he's also on the Audit and Cities Audit Subcommittee, we're gonna have a lot of fun at that meeting on Tuesday. <laughs> and he's been in a number of other leadership roles across the city. Oh, and he's also a direct descendant of Matilda Jocelyn Gage. That's why he's here, in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> so um, if there's time at the end of the program, we will take audience questions, which is why you have index cards on your chairs. So if you have any questions, write them down on the index cards, pass it over to one of us, and uh, we'll try to make sure that it gets asked at the end. Thank you. Greg, you wanna? Yeah? We have a, oh. we'll do our, oh. yeah. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Um, so uh, it's a little pre-birthday present uh, to the League of Women Voters, uh, but we have a proclamation here uh, for them, and I'm going to read some of it, or most of it, um, without the whereas, because I, I think that is uh, implied. Uh, so, uh, whereas, uh, the League of Women Voters was founded in 1920 as a mighty political experiment by the four mothers of the suffragist movement at the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And with the tireless efforts over the last 100 years to strengthen and uphold its mission to empower voters and defend democracy, the League has become a trusted nonpartisan grassroots organization with state and local units in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia, Hong Kong, and the Virgin Islands. And the League has sponsored national and state legislation and fought in the courts to protect and strengthen voting rights and free, fair elections, and has actively advocated for civil rights, public education, community health, and the environment. The League believes that active and engaged citizens, irrespective of gender, ethnicity, political affiliation, are the foundation of democracy. The League has long championed government systems that are open, transparent, inclusive, and equitable, and have been noted for its nonpartisan election information, including sponsorship of candidate forums and information on state and local ballot measures, as well as a commitment to register, educate, and mobilize vo voters to get out the vote. And whereas, the League of Women Voters in Santa Monica has been committed to making democracy work in Santa Monica since 1934. Now, therefore, I, Greg Morena, city council member of City of Santa Monica, on behalf of the members of the city uh, council and the mayor, we do hereby proclaim February 14th as League of Women Voters Day. Yeah, yeah. I'll 
All right. Thank you. Thank you. Would you two like to yeah. take it away? Yeah, please? we'll take it away. All right. Well, uh, thanks everybody for coming um, and sharing uh, a little bit of our story uh, together. I think we've pieced it. Uh, I should say you've pieced it together for <laughs> us. Uh, my part is is very fragmented. Um, you know, uh, much like when you're eating dinner at home or uh, somebody does something at home that reminds you of a family member, uh, you say, oh, that's like so-and-so. Um, and so uh, uh, in our house now, whenever somebody in the family does something rebellious, uh, you go, oh, blame it on Matilda. <laughs> right. uh, so we've been saying that for a while anyways in our house. Um, but. Uh, tonight, I'm sure you all know, uh, but it might be helpful uh, if people are tuning in or uh, when they do tune in, uh, for us to hear what a suffragist is, was. Uh, maybe we'll start there. Okay. Matilda Jocelyn Gage, um, she missed the first women's suffrage convention in 1848 in Seneca Falls only because she had had a baby the day before, so <laughs> she couldn't come. But in 1852, she attended her first women's suffrage meeting in Syracuse at the Syracuse City Hall. There were 2,000 people. Um, she had no idea, she'd never been to a convention before, but most of these people had not either, the women. But she had written a speech, and eventually she got up and made it. And the speech was so well received. Um, she told what women had already accomplished. She didn't say what women might do if they got the vote or got rights. She said what they had accomplished, and that just launched her into the women's movement. People thought, well, why didn't I know about these women? Because she was quite a historian. And from there, she became a speaker, an organizer, um, a published author. She was really a spokesperson for the women's movement. Um, and I think that's where it begins, right, is when you write something or how you communicate it. I mean, today we do it a little bit differently. Right, most of the times right. we're on our phone, and you know it's called content generation. She was uh, an expert at social media. <laughs> yeah, in her right, day, right. that was in newspapers. Right. Right, that right. was newspapers. That's she got right. a governor kicked out of office in New York State, and she couldn't even vote, but she right. did it with handbills and, yeah. um, you know. And he probably should have been kicked out. He was. Right? Oh yeah, yeah definitely. Right. Good. Good. Definitely. Good. Right. And I have to say, she was also a whiz at civil disobedience, okay? Yeah. She could think of really good demonstrations to do and to get attention for the movement. Yeah. And so she really enjoyed that. Well, we're, we're, rebel. I'm, we're gonna tell some of those stories. Right, that's the rebel uh, that we hear in my house all the time when someone does something they're not <laughs> supposed to, right? Um, so let me ask, you came up with this title, and I think it's apropos, um, and there's some meaning behind it that I had no idea about over a hundred years ago. Um, it, it was a different time. And so can you tell us what born criminal is or what, what how, how do you, how did you come up with that? I found it because Matilda's the one who said it. Um, in 1893, she was um, elderly. She was home one night in her home near Syracuse, New York, and a deputy sheriff knocked on the door and he had come to arrest her. Mm. And she said later, you know, everything I ever did wrong went through my head, <laughs> but I forgot that he had come to arrest her for registering to vote, okay? That was her crime. And she said, I forgot I was a born criminal, a woman. So she gave me the title. Yeah. I, and she was found guilty, and she appealed the decision, and she lost the appeal, too. I mean, it, it was a different time, uh, and unfortunate uh, in many respects. Um, and it took the strength of these strong women and a lot of people coming together uh, to change things. And we're still doing it on a number of issues. And uh, we do it all the time with our community service um, and, and when we take on these, these broad public issues. So um, I didn't introduce us uh, formally, but um, and a couple new people came in. Uh, if you don't know, it looks like you may know her already. Uh, but Angelica Shirley Carpenter um, is the author of Born Criminal. Um, and she wrote this book, uh, I guess it was founded with the love of the Oz books. Um, and from there she figured out uh, who was the matriarch and the patriarchs of, of those stories. And uh, when you dig a little deeper, uh, you find out uh, why Dorothy um, is the heroine of Oz. 
and why she ousts the man um, who is behind the curtain and pulling the levers that don't make any sense. Um, and it's because uh, the guy who wrote that book, uh, his mother-in-law was Matilda Jocelyn Gage. Right. Um, so thank you for doing all of that. Oh, Thanks. it's my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, in the end, what did you find? What, what did you gather from all of this research? Um, maybe where you started and then <laughs> where you ended in this research. Well, uh, boy, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was... Uh, it, actually, it only took me eight years okay. to write this book. Uh, <laughs> I did uh, a lot of research for it. Um, there wasn't much written about her when I started the project. I started it in 2010. I had hosted an Oz convention in Fresno. Let's, oh, this is some of her, these are Sorry, some of her letters. The computer okay? took a life of its own. Interesting. Mm -hmm. What? The computer took a life of its own. Well, that's all right. Just leave it there. That's fine. Okay. So um, one of the things I needed to do was to read her letters. And I'm lucky that as a retired librarian, I have interlibrary loan privileges in Fresno. Mm -hmm. And they could get her letters for me on microfilm. Mm -hmm. So if you look here, I call these the good, the bad, and the ugly of her letters. Mm -hmm. um, you see that she could print very neatly. That's a letter she wrote to a grandchild. And the one in the middle is my very favorite letter. It's to her son, Clarkson. And she says, I want you to bring my revolver. <laughs> Have it serviced. <laughs> so she was in Philadelphia uh, in 1876 during the World's uh, Fair, and there was a huge argument in Philadelphia about whether the fair should be open on Sunday or not. And so Matilda <laughs> sent for her gun because she was afraid there was going to be... Now, we don't know, did he actually bring the gun? Okay, we, and, uh, and we know she didn't son, shoot anybody. Son. We'll her son maybe son. Uh, calmed down. <laughs> yeah. But that's my favorite letter. And then the uh, other one, just an example of the terrible handwriting, terrible microfilm that's real old. It took me months to read her letters, literally yeah. months. And so um, in, in researching this, how did you begin? Because uh, I don't know if everyone knows, but um, there's some historical sites back east. Right, um, right. And so it may be helpful to explain uh, some of the houses that are back there. And um, we've got some folks in the Smithsonian and some different museums. Right. Can you go back with the? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So this, this is her scrapbook <laughs> okay. that's in right. the um, that Library of Congress. Right. Right. And uh, there's a good story about that. I, I had one day to read this scrapbook. And they told me that I could take 20 pictures of it without a flash. But there were lots more than 20 pages. So I was like crazily yeah. trying to figure out which 20 pages. And at the end of the day, a nice librarian, I've forgotten his name, came up to me and said, I'm going to take you where you can take your pictures now. He put the scrapbook on a cart. He rolled it down the hall into a little office, and he said, I hope you won't mind if I step away for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Librarians are uh, great, you uh, know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so I took 84 pictures. <laughs> anyway, this, she, she saved clippings, and this scrapbook is a lot of fun. She writes no <laughs> if she disagrees with something. Well, it's interesting. I asked you about the beginning and the end of your research. Uh -huh. Because uh, from the family's perspective, so um, I, I, Natasha gave me a, Natalia, I call her Natasha because she explained to me her name can go either way in Russian, and now I always say Natasha even though it's Natalia. Um, so uh, Natasha said that, you know, I'm a city council member in town, um, but I'm also the great, great, great grandson of Matilda. Um, and so uh, in that, the stories that I have are slightly different, um, and so books like these we have in our family, just kind of all over the place. And you can imagine as a kid going through some of these books, and sometimes, you know, uh, this is specific to Matilda, but we have old L. Frank. I know um, you do. Yeah. <laughs> we have old L. Frank writings, um, and he wrote with this backhand. He was left-handed. Yeah, so this way, <laughs> right? And, and it was an incredible script. Um, but these original documents, these are 100-year-old documents and 100-year-old books and beyond. Um, we just found a book after searching for 15 years about the art of window dressing. Um, you have that? Yeah, we oh, finally wow. got it. Um, <laughs> but it was the first book that was written on merchandising. Because back in the day, you would have a board on the window and you would write on the board what was in the store. 
right? Things changed a little bit. So, um, so these documents to me are very personal. Um, I see them often, I recall them often, um, although I haven't read them. <laughs> um, I very much appre appreciate Angelica uh, going through and doing that research and, and sharing some of the more detailed stories of our history. Um, so uh, obviously, you know, if you fast forward um, today, uh, Susan B. Anthony has a picture on a coin. Um, Matilda doesn't have a coin. No. Right. So what was different about Matilda? Well, Matilda um, actually worked very closely with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton for decades. They worked together. They rotated in and out of offices of the National Women's Suffrage Association. Um, they, they really were a good team. Matilda kind of tended to stay on the East Coast more and set up conventions. And, and Susan B. Anthony, who was quite the star speaker, went out all the way to California even to speak. But you know, they, they really did a thing together for many, many years. But as time went on, um, Matilda never changed. She never compromised. She was going to have her way, my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. She did not compromise. Susan B. Anthony got tired of asking people to give women the vote. And she started making a deal with religious conservative women, like the Women's Christian Temperance Union, who wanted God in the Constitution, mm. Jesus in the public schools, um, God as the ruler of all mankind. And Matilda really felt that a religion had oppressed women very seriously, at least since the beginning of the Christian era. Mm. And she wanted a separation of church and state. So they had a falling out over that. And of the three of them, Matilda was the youngest, but she died first, and the other two wrote histories, wrote autobiographies, um, and they just left her out. Mm. So, so and, and one of the really interesting things, because I, I always wondered, oh, you know, why isn't my great-great-great-grandmother in the stories, and where was she, you mm -hmm. know, in all of this? Um, and one of the things I learned in reading the book was that uh, they all sat down. Uh, there was the, the history of women suffrage suffrage and they all sat down to write this book right and it was the three of them and matilda was the workhorse well matilda and elizabeth katie stanton did the writing susan b anthony was the publisher right so they have all these documents mm -hmm. and they yes. relied heavily on yes. matilda's they research did. they did and so in putting all of this together volume one was so much of matilda's effort and as they put all of this work together, maybe you can better explain the story, but, it, but this is what happened. And then it came over three volumes, or can you help us? She worked on the first three volumes okay. before she died. After she died, Susan B. Anthony hired someone to continue it. Stanton had also quit writing it. And the fourth volume just sort of demoted Matilda from co-author to a helpful assistant, mm. you know? But if you read the first three volumes, Matilda's right in there. In Can the, you, let's go forward, and there's probably some pictures coming up that would talk about that. Let's see. Oh, there's some. There's the history of women's suffrage. Oh, there it is. Um, I tried. Right. To, I mean, it's really quite interesting reading. Um, and some people said they shouldn't write it. They they shouldn't be writing the history of the women's movement when they were still involved in it. But mm. they said, well, who's going to write it if we don't? So right. Right. <laughs> they did. And, and what's the Women, Church, and State? Can you explain Women, that Church, a little and bit State more? was her standalone book. Mm. Um, honestly, if you, that's a good book to have in the library. <laughs> it's, All right. I, I wasn't sure. I mean, I didn't believe it would be as interesting as it was. It's really interesting. And it tells how first churches, first Christian churches, oppressed women. I mean, it says how. how pre-Christian societies, women had things better. And even in the Indian society, the Haudenosaunee who lived near Matilda, women had equal rights to men. But churches oppressed women, and then as governments took over from churches, governments oppressed women in the same way and had all these rules about mm. keeping women down. And when she wrote this book in 1893, for instance, this is the most shocking example I can think of. Um, the age of consent for sexual activity in Delaware was seven years old oh. for a girl. And she raged in this book about this is a baby victim, and these are laws made by men so that they can assault baby victims. 
Okay, when the book came out, Anthony Comstock, who was the head of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, threatened to put in jail anyone who gave that book to a child to read. He didn't care that seven-year-olds were getting raped. He just didn't want anybody reading about it or mailing it. If it went through the mail, he was going to arrest people. So it's quite, a, I mean, it would be a radical book today. Yeah. It's still, and it's very interesting reading, yeah. truly. Well, and I think just to unpack that a little bit more, because um, it was something that I didn't quite understand the nuance and the split of Matilda to Susan B. and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And it was centered around the church. Right. And so politically, and it's fascinating, and as a politician, I'm learning the different groups who have influence one way or another or who believe certain things, and you align yourself with them because that's what you believe. And you think, wow, you know, if I invest my time and I invest my energy with this group and this group is what I believe, then those efforts will move forward and the world will be a better place because of it. And so can you help, understand, help us understand yes. where that happened with Susan? Because that was the defining moment. That was the big split. That was. Right. Um, well, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was headed by Frances Willard, who was a very charismatic, dramatic speaker. And she had about 200,000 members. Okay, mm. Matilda's organization had about 2,000 members. Mm. So when Susan B. Anthony took up with the Women's Christian Temperance Union, she got a lot of support, and it was all across the country. Um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union believed that if women got the vote, they would vote for temperance. Mm. They didn't particularly care that women should have equal rights or you know, equal pay. They just thought they wanted temperance, and they thought if women got the vote, they'd vote for temperance. And guess what they did? As soon as women got the vote, the United States got prohibition. Mm. So it, it happened. Mm. Now whether, I mean, but Matilda said no, she would not make a deal with them because they were imposing religion upon the United States and she thought we had come too far to go back to that. It's an incredible study and had I not gotten into you know, public service, I don't know that I would have understood it the same way, um, but it was a political strategy, mm -hmm. right? That, right? That ultimately created the big split. And to Susan Beat's credit, I mean, what she did by getting those That's members right. eventually on worked. her side, it eventually worked. Right. And then there's another, and I'll just tell you how far it goes. I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase here. Um, but in 1920, um, it was the, it, it, well, in 1914, 14 to 17 was World War I. And we had gone to fight, um, you know, the forces of evil uh, over the pond. Um, and in doing that, we were fighting for people's rights that, didn't share those same rights in our own country. Um, and so uh, the, the political value of granting people rights in the United States in 1920 was so intense that the 19th Amendment was ultimately ratified. Uh, but when did that start? Because I, uh, it was your book, and I'm looking through it. I was trying to find the page. 1888? Yeah, 18... no, it was before that. Okay, it all was... right. So tell us what happened at that time, because that was the beginning of it. Honestly, I can't remember the year, but it, they introduced uh, an Equal Rights Amendment in the 1870s or 1880s, and they had a senators, they had one or more senators who introduced it every single year for a while, and then they let it go, and then they reintroduced it later on in the 19 teens. But yeah. it, it was for many, many years because that was another split. Um, the more radical women's rights people like Matilda, like Susan B. Anthony, um, wanted a constitutional amendment to change everything all at once right now. The more conservative women's rights people thought, well, let's give, um, they called it the Negro's Hour, let's give black men the right to vote first and then we'll worry about women of all colors, maybe, or something. And uh, let's do it state by state. We'll, we'll win it state by state. Matilda wanted constitutional amendment and win it mm. now. Yeah. And 30 years it ultimately took yeah. uh, to get that, uh, that amendment ratified. Um, and it was Wilson, I believe, was the yes. president at the time. Um, who got the ball over the line and he well, knew. he didn't want to do it. I, he, he was, <laughs> did, tell us that story because that's an incredible uh, force of leverage yeah. um, that, to be honest, was it totally 
manufactured, created by women at the time, and just incredibly smart and political savvy women um, who had spent 30 years navigating those back channels. Oh, well, when they were around, the, you know, the second generation of the women's movement was there, but they were getting arrested, they were being put in jail, they were yeah. being force-fed. I, I wish I could think of the name of it. There's a children's book about this, about Alice Paul, who was leading the movement at this time. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in there, I don't know if it was there or in a documentary I read, that Woodrow Wilson's daughter was influential, too. Mm -hmm. And he said, look here, Dad, you know. <laughs> You got to do it. I mean, I think yeah. lots of presidents knew it was going to happen, but they didn't want it to happen on their watch. Mm -hmm. And he finally gave in. And it's it's remarkable to think a hundred years later uh, that it is an absolute right. We're all equal. That is just what it is. And the fact that you know women didn't have a right to vote a hundred years ago seems totally ludicrous. We still don't have an Equal Rights Amendment, however. <laughs> um, uh, and still good old Virginia do. has yeah. just ratified it, and yeah. maybe we're going to go forward with that. I yeah. don't know. I, I, don't know. I, I mean, we're, we're privileged to live in California. I think we're, uh, we're, we're a bit more liberal here, I guess, in that way, but um, something that seems um, so logical, and especially in Santa Monica, um, <laughs> you know, uh, we're born with this stuff, right? I mean, uh, I've got, you know, my teacher from high school here. Uh, I used to go to her class when my brother was in her class um, and eat her cookies. And, you know, for me, women being at the top of the pyramid is normal, right? That's what it was. That's what I grew up with. I mean, if you read The Wizard of Oz and you believe it, right, Dorothy's the boss. She's the one that handles everything. Let's go forward with a slide or two yeah. here. See what we've got. Well, this is Matilda's house. And this is a museum now near Syracuse. So if you ever go to Syracuse, there's lots of women's history sites, including a national park that you can visit, and you can visit her house. Mm. Go ahead. Oh, this is, this is a civil disobedience act, OK? Mm. Here's the 4th of July celebration at Independence Hall in Philadelphia, July 4th, 1876. Mm. And Matilda and others, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, applied to speak on behalf mm. of women at this, you know, half the population who couldn't vote. Mm. And of course, they got told, no, well, change. Um, Matilda decided to do it anyway. Mm. Let's see. Move forward? Yeah. Okay, so she and these four other ladies um, took the declaration, got tickets, which wasn't easy, go ahead, and um, stormed the podium from behind. They were seated up behind the podium. They ran toward the podium. Now, there were, they were expecting President Grant to be there, but he didn't come. Actually, it was the vice president who was there. But think about it. They were going to give this, this Declaration of Rights for Women to President Grant, whether he wanted it or not. Well, even in 1876, there were soldiers and police and security mm. around the president or the vice president of the United States. But these women were all so well-dressed and respectable looking that the men just got out of the way. <laughs> and <laughs> they gave the proclamation to the vice president, who was actually in favor of women's yeah. rights. He took it back to Washington and put it up on the wall in his office. And then they ran out, back up the stairs, ran out, throwing out copies into the audience. And they could easily have been arrested, yeah. but they did not get arrested. I mean, the, the, what's really interesting is, is, you know, 100 years later now, you know, we're we're conscious of women's rights, right? And hopefully everyone believes that women's rights are equal among any person. And yet we still have things to fight against. Um, and there's a really great story, and I would love for you to tell it, uh, with the Statue of Liberty. Oh, yeah, I think and that's the next slide. Is that it? Okay, Try great, because that's a good Oh, well, now this is the court. We'll, we'll get story. to it, but before we do, this is the courthouse where Susan B. Anthony was tried, arrest, she was arrested, and then she was tried and found guilty of voting. And the judge <laughs> said, you, you voted, and you knew you were a woman, and you voted anyway. You're guilty. So change. <laughs> There she is. This was the most famous case. And um, go change. And there's the courtroom. That's my friend, Susan, when we went to see this place. Mm. Notice the most famous thing that ever happened in this courthouse was the trial of Susan B. Anthony. And look at the pictures mm. on the walls today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All men. Well, and, and that, and Matilda defended her. Yes, Matilda right? was right there with her. 
Right. And she and Matil she and Susan B. Anthony went around and spoke about you know the United States on trial, not Susan B. Anthony. Yeah. Go ahead. We'll get to the. Um, Oh, now this is how they looked. This is how Matilda and her husband looked mm -hmm. at the time when their daughters got married. And they're, all three of their daughters got married in an 18-month period. Mm -hmm. Think of it. And Matilda put on three weddings in that time. Yeah. And if you change to the next slide, this is their youngest daughter, Maud, who, who married L. Frank Baum. So you see what a handsome couple they were. Mm -hmm. Keep going. We will eventually. Oh, here we go. Statue of Liberty. Right, well, let me just tell one, okay. one uh, bit of a family story. So, um, in our family, you know, uh, women take charge and, you know, they're often the boss. And Matilda was that same way. Um, and one of the things I learned in this book was that how many times uh, Matilda's husband had failed or had gotten sick or was just challenged by something. And Matilda comes in and saves the day. I mean, over and over again, uh, in, so far one time they, they moved their family as they were um, you know, pioneering um, Aber in Aberdeen. Uh, she moves the family and she sticks by the family and helps raise the family. And you know, as Maude and L. Frank are, are being raised, she's helping with the kids and running the shop and taking, I mean. She was a multitasker. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, with no cell phone. <laughs> uh, but this is a good uh, civil disobedience story. Yeah. Um, it's one Actually, of my they, favorite. they weren't even so disobedient. Here now, okay, this is the dedication of the yeah. Statue of Liberty, yeah. 1886, okay? They, they, again, the New York State Women's Suffrage Association wrote and asked permission to be on the island with the statue and to make a speech on behalf of women, half of the population, and they were told no, no women were going to make a speech, no women were going to be allowed on the island. Unless accompanied by a man. Was that? No. That wasn't just it? No. <laughs> Awesome. That's a, news, a quote from a newspaper, too, uh, okay. so I don't know. All but right. All right. Actually, two, I think two women did get on, but you know, anyway. Okay. So what they did was um, they applied then to be in the boat parade. And you see, and this doesn't look quite like a parade, but there were boats all along the Hudson. Mm -hmm. And you had to have permission to be in this naval parade, and they got permission to do that. Mm -hmm. So they had to rent a boat. Well, the only change, let's see if we go here, the only boat they could find was a cattle barge. <laughs> And the captain promised them that he would have it scoured before they got on the boat. <laughs> but he did not keep his word. And the boat smelled mm. terrible. Can you imagine? And um, I don't know what the next picture is. Let's see. Now we'll go to Aberdeen. Yeah. There's, uh, so anyway, I could not get that cattle barge out of my mind. And keep it in your mind, because I'm going to show you mm. another picture that's relevant to it. But essentially, they. When they crashed the opening. Well, they didn't crash it. They just parked right under the statue. <laughs> they, they got the best seat, uh, the that's... best anchorage right, right under the statue, yeah. right between two warships, right. okay, two huge battleships. Right. And there they were, and they had megaphone, and they were yelling, but um, they, they weren't doing anything illegal. Yeah, it's, it, it's towing the line, yeah. right? I mean, that's... Uh, <laughs> and they made the front page of the New York Times, so they were thrilled about that. Even better. Yeah, right. I think Miss Baxter can speak to how I towed <laughs> the line in high school often. Uh, uh, but it, it, is a, it is a fantastic story. It, is, it speaks to the indomitable spirit um, of and these women. By the way, why they were protesting is they did not think it was right for a woman to represent liberty in a country where women had no liberty. <laughs> so right. that was their, they thought it was a beautiful statue. They didn't have any complaints about that. Yeah, but it is ironic mm -hmm. you know, to have a woman represent liberty, yet not give women the right to vote right. or even equal rights. Um, you know, it, it's a terrible irony. And thank God we're moving past it, uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, so the next slide um, is a little bit what I touched on earlier when they were pioneering, and they were moving folks out west from New York. Times are hard in New York at this time, but Aberdeen, which was where several railroads met, was this thriving, bustling city where businesses were going strong. And eventually, all four of Matilda's adult children moved their families to Aberdeen. And by this time, she was a widow by the time the last ones went. But she used to spend, now this maybe doesn't speak too well for her since, Winters in Aberdeen. Mm -hmm. Who would do that? Yeah. <laughs> South Dakota. Oh. It was Dakota Territory then. 
No. So um, she spent winters, because she couldn't really run her house by herself after her husband died. Mm. She would close up her house in the winter and move in with the bombs, L. Frank Baum and Maude, and they had four boys eventually. So she spent her winters with them in Aberdeen. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it speaks to the, you know, the women who were part of that movement west. Um, and you know, maybe by the time we got to California, we realized just we can't do it, right? We can't, we must include women as equal partners in this process as we move across the country. And we didn't get it then, right, as a country. She was really hopeful that um, Aberdeen would come into the union as, I mean, that South Dakota would come into the union as a state giving women the right to vote. And she went out there in the 18, late 1870s and campaigned when Dakota Territory was yeah. becoming a state. But they didn't do it. But women, I mean, and, and, and she pointed out that women could homestead. I yeah. mean, they did have the right to, to have homesteads, which was something anyway. Yeah. And she, she was very sorry that she didn't get that. Well, and one of the great connections that I had found, um, I'll give you the family story of this, and, and, it, and it stems from South Dakota when L. Frank had, was writing a, a paper and wrote something that you know, was um, not so nice towards the Native Americans. And um, again, this incredibly ironic piece of family history um, where the Haudenosaunee, um, I believe it was before they had moved to South Dakota, um, had uh, uh, gave Matilda the honor of um, a, a mother. A, was there a specific term? I know that she was a. They they made her a member of um, the Mohawk clan. And they gave her a title, uh, she who holds the sky. Yeah, a name, a uh -huh. name, and she would have had voting rights. Actually, it was later, so she was um, older then. She. If she had stayed there, if she had lived in that culture, and this was in New York, she would have had voting rights in the Haudenosaunee Nation, in the Mohawk Nation, that she would never, never have in the United States. So it, it speaks to this, this great dichotomy of two cultures, um, in that you had this advanced, culturally um, relevant and, you know, uh, almost utopian world with the Native Americans um, in so much as that they recognize women um, as equal parts um, in uh, rulers uh, of their domain. Um, and Matilda was brought into that. Um, she was very interested in it. Um, she definitely attended events. And again, social media, the newspapers of this time reported on both European kind of civilization events and Haudenosaunee ones. So if a new chief was elected or they had a ceremony, these things were in the newspapers and people read about them back and forth. And in, that, in, the, in the Indian culture, women elected the chiefs and the chiefs did what chiefs do. But if the chiefs dissatisfied the women, they just took them out of office. Yeah. <laughs> so they definitely had rights. Yeah. You know, they were yeah. different from, from ours, but. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's how it works now. <laughs> uh, whether it's explained okay. that way or not, uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly the low man on the totem pole yeah. in my house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sanitation and maintenance are, are my official <laughs> titles at home. I'm fine with it. Um, I have no aspirations. Um, so Matilda has this incredible honor uh, with the Native Americans. Um, she's she's given the name uh, She Who Holds the Sky. Yes. Um, as someone who thinks so big and so grand. Um, and you know, many years later, or somewhere in the timeline, it's hard for me to piece together because this is a family story, um, L. Frank writes something in a South Dakota newspaper, and he doesn't speak well of the Native Americans. And he has this, we have this great scar on our family history. Um, and that's how I knew the story. Um, and so um, 10 years ago or so, my mom, who's here in the audience, she, uh, she goes back east, or South Dakota, um, to apologize um, to this group of Native Americans. Um, in exchange for that, uh, for that apology, uh, they gave you a star blanket. And so 
Uh, it took us quite some time to realize the fault of our errors, uh, but we did it and we're better for it. Uh, but it just gives you um, a glimpse of how volatile the political history was um, that within a generation you can be granted such great honors um, and then you can royally screw it up. Um, and you know, decades later we figure that out and we make amends and we move forward uh, and, and, and we're better for it. Um, but it just shows you how delicate the balance was at that time. Um, and you know, as, as they moved west and as they moved on with their life, um, you know, we get into the Oz story um, and we get into this idea of Hollywood and uh, the new way to communicate right. with people um, and what that means. So uh, if you can... Yeah, give me a, let's see what we got. Oh, we got Chicago. Well, they we're, moved we're to keep, Chicago. We're keep going west. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're going back uh, east because uh, Elf, Aberdeen fell on hard times too, mostly right. because of a drought. The wheat crops failed, and so all of the businesses that had been doing so well began to fail. So L. Frank Baum moved his family to Chicago right. where a big world's fair was starting up. And it, this fair attracted a lot of kind of artistic people. He worked first as a China salesman, uh, first as a reporter and then as a China salesman. And while he was on the road selling China <coughs> and telling people how to arrange the China to um, sell it better, he would write, he missed his four sons. And while he was on the road, he would write stories and poems. And when he came home, he would share those with his boys and with the this neighbors. This is what year now? Sorry. In the 1890s. All right. And um, one thing led to another. And, but I mean, Matilda died before he started writing the Oz books. Yeah. But she did encourage him. If you look, there's a picture of the fair. Some people think that this fair, which was called the White City, inspired the Emerald City. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Emerald City. Yeah. <laughs> people had to wear sunglasses because it was so bright mm -hmm. when they did. Go ahead. See what's next. Oh, and there was a balloon ascension every day at the fair. Does that ring a bell with anybody <laughs> in the Wizard of Oz? <laughs> Keep going. Matilda thought that Chicago was a great spiritual center. Mm. And uh, I put this slide in because I knew Gita was going to be here tonight, too. Um, she, Matilda was always looking for, I think, an explanation of life that did not involve religion. She had pretty well ruled out. She believed in religion herself, she said. She was a very re religious or spiritual person. But she didn't believe in organized religion that oppressed mm. women. Yeah. So she looked to palmistry, astrology, theosophy, <coughs> phrenology, feeling people's heads, trying. And like with the astrological predictions, she'd write them down. Mm. And then she'd go back and check to see whether they came true or not. Mm. Mostly they didn't come true. Mm. But she was always looking, and she was always learning and trying something new. Well, I think it's the, it's the, it's the movement, and as time went on, um, the, we got better, right? Um, we, we communicated more, uh, cities grew. At this point, uh, we're into the Industrial Revolution, um, you know, the, the great businesses of the era of oil and trains. Um, things started changing in America, um, and we were part of that, although the women's suffrage movement, um, you know, was trying to resolve itself. Um, we have this proposal before Congress, uh, and so can you just touch back into what was happening with women's rights at that time? You know, we're getting into 1900 at this point. Yeah, well, Matilda died in, 18, in 1898, right. and um, she'd been ill for several years before that. I really honestly don't know a lot about what happened around 1900 because yeah. I kind of end with Matilda in 1898. Right. She and Susan B. Anthony had this split in the early 1890s um, and Stanton, even though she really believed like Matilda that state and religion should be separate, stuck with Anthony, which hurt Matilda's feelings very badly. Mm. and. So they kind of went on with the women's movement, and Matilda withdrew from it. Now, she kept writing. That's when she was writing Women, Church, and, mm -hmm. Women, Church, and State. And she kept writing speeches. Whoops. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so she didn't stop thinking about the movement or about what should be done, but she quit going to conventions. Yeah. 
Well, and, and it was her writing of women, church, and state um, as we were going into the new century um, that would be her legacy. That's right. Right? That's and so right. it was her legacy. It was her relationship with um, her, uh, at, at that point, her sons um, who her were, son. or her son who, and grandsons now who were carrying forward the legacy. And what they had is this book about women, church, and state. And then they had a lot of family stories um, about the relationships um, that she had and the part that she played in women's suffrage. I'll tell you what happened in the 1970s was there was a second women's movement and they found Matilda. And those people started reading Women, Church, and State. And they right. said, why didn't we know about her? Why, d uh, you know? So I think I'm one of those people. I just came to it kind of like, can we go forward with the slide? Mm -hmm. I think we get to, oh, well, here's Al Frank Baum and his four sons. Aren't they handsome? Well, let me, so so this, is, this is a really interesting point. You know, my mom's a psychotherapist and a doctor. And, <laughs> and what you get out of this, um, and she even wrote a book about it, The Wisdom of, uh, Wisdom of Oz, what we get about it as a, as a society um, at this point, at the turn of the century, Matilda, you know, leaves this life, it leaves us with a book about women, church, and state. Um, she leaves us with a legacy of women's suffrage, of, you know, their right to vote and their place in equality. And then who takes over, right, out of all people, is her son-in-law, right? That is the continuation of the story. Really, and, it is. It is. And so much so that his story is not hard facts and you know incredible research and the church and what the church is doing from a hierarchical st standpoint and what that means, but he turns the thing totally upside down. It's totally fantastic. It makes zero sense. And he got a lot of grief for it in his first, you know, as he started writing these stories, because there was no logical uh, tie to a lot of this stuff. But, you know, in, in the mind of a creative, right, this sort of dissident thinking comes together. And what we understood as a nation at that point was Dorothy Gale, the all-powerful Dorothy Gale, could so easily uproot the Wizard of Oz. And witch. A couple of witches. <laughs> right. Well, the witch is no problem, right? <laughs> um, but, but who, who the, the kingdom of Oz uh, was apparently ruled by, she pulled back the curtain. I mean, we still, call, we still say it today, you know? That's right, What's behind do. the curtain? It was the Wizard of Oz, some kooky old man who really didn't have his stuff together. And it was the woman who exposed him. There's a new and book the hero. that bears you out called Amazons in America. <laughs> yeah. And this, I just read it this week, and it says that L. Frank Baum put Matilda's theories of matriarch that, that a, a, a land ruled by women would be fairer and more just, put that into operation in us. Let's have some more slides. Well, I like that this slide is when he was telling these stories to his boys. Mm -hmm. And he and Matilda were writing under the same roof. She was living with them by this time. I love to think of him writing fairy tales mm -hmm. and her attacking churches. You know, and they're writing, <laughs> and they must come down to dinner. <laughs> so go ahead with the next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a, after she died, they wrote her out of history. These two did, Susan B. Anthony on the left and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. But if you go to the next slide, L. Frank Baum did not forget her. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why Dorothy, um, well, I mean, there's lots of reasons why, but she's a very brave American heroine. Um, and that's in the first book. At the end of the first book is, you know, the wizard flies off. Mm. And in the second book, the rightful ruler of the land of Oz comes to the throne, Ozma. And Gita's mother was named Ozma. Um, so give me the next slide, please. But L. Frank Baum poked a little fun at the women's movement in the second book. This is the marvelous land of Oz. And here is uh, General Ginger and her army of revolt. <laughs> and they're getting ready to take over the Emerald City. And the gatekeeper, well, the, the gatekeeper says, what do you want? And Ginger says, we're revolting. And he says, well, you don't look it. <laughs> so, you know, he had jokes with it, too. Yeah. But I mean, in the end, not Ginger. Ginger gets sent home to her mother. But yeah. a, a woman comes to the throne of Oz. And after that, women rule Oz. Mm. And it's a much better place. Yeah. There are no more slaves. The Winkies aren't slaves. The winged mm. monkeys aren't slaves. Mm. 
you know, ding dong, the witch is dead, it's, it's over. Well, and just quick note, this is how I grew up. This was my grandma, <laughs> right? She was the ruler of Oz, right? And so my awesome. entire life was Oz, and there is the, the queen of Oz um, who is my grandma, and I'm having, you know, Thanksgiving dinner with her. Um, so, uh, you know, th this is normal for me. Um, you know, I, I see no difference. Um, but what I understood, you know, as a child was the Wizard of Oz. Um, and it wasn't until much later that I learned the real history and why he wrote the things he did and what he believed. And what he believed was that we are all equal and that a woman who rules is a just ruler. Um, and so uh, I'm going to get to what we can do today, um, but I'll tell you last week, um, when I went before the Santa Monica Democratic Club, I threw my support behind Elizabeth Warren. And I did that specifically because one day we are going to have a president who is a woman. There is no question about it. And the sooner that happens, the better it will be. And if anything can be close to Oz, we will need a woman to rule. So. Um, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, that's part of what I'm doing. But you know, in, in all of your research and all of your wisdom, you know, what can what can we all do um, to to help promote this you know this concept um, you know this idea of equality and and how can we carry some of the the things that you know Matilda did forward. Well, like the League of Women Voters, we we need to register to vote. We need to get the vote out. Um, Join the club. Yeah, right. Join the league, yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah. The league is what does it. Um, I, I haven't got an answer. It, it's just we've, we've got to change things. We really do. Right. We really do. Well, and in the spirit of Matilda, right, how did she change things? Matilda um, never compromised, <laughs> okay, and we shouldn't either. Mm -hmm. um, we need, I can't speak to the present. I can't speak to the present, but um, what I admired about Matilda, especially, oh, I admired many things about Matilda. I didn't really know that much about her when I started writing, but when she encountered resistance, it only made her stronger. Mm -hmm. And her father taught her this. When she was young, she was taking um, anti-slavery petitions door to door, and some people would sign them. She was a child. Some people would sign them. and. Other people would say, you know, what are you doing? Girls shouldn't be doing this. You take this home. Get out of here. And her father said, that means you're doing something right. Mm -hmm. If you upset people and people mm -hmm. fight you, you're doing something right. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think we just have to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. And that's our lesson that we can learn from Matilda. Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, today, I, I, I heard um, our mayor speak. And um, in his words of wisdom, he left us with is that we need to reach for things that are out of our grasp. Mm -hmm. Good. I think there's only one more slide, maybe. Well, it's perfect, because I have yeah. one oh, that's more. It. And it's this slide that I wanted to share with you all. Oh, okay. So um, what I am going to do, literally right after this, uh, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to tell my kids about this book that's coming out. And what this book means to me um, is not just my family history and you know, why they need to know and you know, our funny, kooky stories. Um, but it is literally a picture book. It's a picture book of the women's suffrage movement. Um, it is a book about liberty, mm -hmm. right, which is mm -hmm. what we so believe in this country. Um, and when this book is out in September, September. thank you, um, <laughs> when this book is out in September, um, I'm going to be the first one in line, uh, and I'm going to buy it, and I'm going to go home to my kids. I'm going to read it to my kids. And that's what we can do. That's right. And right. this is where I told you to remember the cattle barge. Well, here they are on the cattle barge. <laughs> yeah. um, that's Matilda on the, in the middle there, kind of in the dark, in the gray coat, and her best friend and the best friend's daughter. And the three of them together led this demonstration at the Statue of Liberty. And 
it's so exciting. That's what this book means to me. It's my first picture book. I've been writing them for like 20 or 30 years, and finally I'm going to get one published. Um, and they got a wonderful illustrator, Edwin Fotheringham, to do the pictures. He's way better known than I am, so I'm very grateful. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to be grateful for this book, but maybe I'll get the cattle barge out of my head now. <laughs> well, more importantly for me um, is that you know, we'll teach our kids. We'll teach the next generation uh, what equality means, why it means so much to us, and what liberty truly is. Um, Matilda had an incredible statement. Um, do you know that statement? You know, I always goof it up. There is, <laughs> there is, there's no word. There's sweeter. a word sweeter than mother, home, or heaven. <laughs> heaven. That word is liberty. Thank you. <laughs> I could never is. do that off the top right. of my head. That's on right. her tombstone. Right. There is no word sweeter than mother, no. home. There's a word sweeter. Oh, there is a word. Sweeter than All mother, right. home, home, or heaven. heaven. And, and that, that word, word is, is liberty. liberty. <laughs> All right. All so uh, that'll thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. If you have any questions and Are you're okay to stay, questions? if anybody, no, I don't. Did we, yeah, we had uh, no cards. If anyone wanted, wanted to write down a question, we probably could field a couple of questions. Anybody has? If anybody any. you has, you guys were very any. thorough in your talk. So that was very <laughs> Thank you. Know you. Everything you need. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, it's a question. Um, how many? I can repeat back the question too. Children. Yeah, she had five, she gave birth to five children. Um, one boy died quite young, but she had a son and three daughters, and they grew up in the movement, okay? They were taking petitions around with her, they were doing mailings, they were um, visiting her at conventions. Um, yes, of course they did. Her kids, you know, she wasn't allowed to go to college. She wanted to be a doctor like her father, but women couldn't go to college in those days. So she fought to make sure that women could get into college, mm -hmm. and then she made sure that all of her children went to college. That's why she was mad when um, her youngest daughter dropped out of mm -hmm. Cornell to marry L. Frank Baum. She mm -hmm. thought that was mm -hmm. terrible. <laughs> but she, her, her kids, one of the reasons they think that Matilda's been forgotten is her kids were not writers, mm -hmm. you know? So like Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter became quite an activist in the movement mm -hmm. and wrote a book about her mother. But Matilda's kids did not, but they were definitely feminists and uh, equal rights and, you know, all of them and, and campaigned always with her. And even after she was gone, they were still writing, but, but not like writing a letter to the editor or, mm. you know. And I'm going to repeat back the question so we can capture it for them. Uh, I'm just so curious as to the falling out mm. uh, between her and the other two suffragettes. Why, I mean, I get why it happened, but what possible excuse could they have had for like totally writing her out? Hmm. So the question is why it was uh, Matilda Rissen out of history? Why did Susan B. Anthony write her out of history? Hmm. Well, I, I don't think they had to explain it. They, they, while they were all three still alive, she kind of left them. You know, she left the organization they had founded together and set off on her own, started her own organization, but she couldn't keep it funded. Um, it, but was after she died, Elizabeth, well, no, even before she died, Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote an autobiography. And she and Matilda had worked so closely together and were so close in thought. And she only mentioned Matilda like 10 times in the whole book. And then her children revised the book later and took out eight of those mentions. Okay? So, huh? It was a bitter. I yeah, think, I, I think it was bitterness, but I also believe that there was a very specific political motive, right? I mean, what was so incredible to read um, through this book was that uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, or mostly Susan B., was incredibly strategic, right? She partnered with an organization that had a hundred times the membership that Matilda's had, and she knew that that was going to put pressure on the electeds. 
right? And so in doing that, right, organization, that political organization, you know, it took another, you know, 20 years or so, but at that point she was in a negotiating position. And had she not had those 200,000 members, what does an elected care about getting voted back into office than, you know, making their constituents happy, right? It, it, it's part of the flaw in our system, right, that, you know, you may not fight for liberty, but you get reelected, right? Uh, it, it's, it's a terrible crack in the foundation. However, in this instance, uh, Susan B. was more strategic. Yes. Right? And it just so happened that Matilda, at that point, was uh, in South Dakota, was in Chicago, was with her family. Her husband had passed. So it was circumstantial, uh, but it was also because Susan B. was just incredibly smart. Uh, another reason may well be that Susan B. Anthony wanted to be the star, okay? And she used to do things, even when Matilda was alive, she took credit for Matilda's writing sometimes. Um, Matilda thought she cheated her out of money on the history of women's suffrage. And, and Susan B. Anthony was incredibly, I think, possessive and jealous of her role as the absolute star of the women's movement. So I think, why, but actually, you know, she hired a biographer or employed a biographer to write her life story, and she wrote it at Susan B. Anthony's house with Susan B. Anthony looking right over her shoulder. Mm -hmm. And but that book mentions Matilda more than Stanton's does. Mm -hmm. It's surprising to me. Um, I I think that I don't know. I, my whole last chapter is devoted to this, so you have to read the book. <laughs> it's an incredible. It, Another it question? Is in, yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm. So, that, so there's no, yeah, so there's nothing. Well, there's some so left. The, um, sorry, I'm going to do this again just <laughs> for being oh, recorded. <laughs> um, wasn't it true that Susan B. Anthony had all her papers uh, destroyed? Okay. Yeah, but she didn't get them all destroyed. You can't even imagine how many letters these people wrote. I mean, thousands and thousands of letters. And there, she has papers at the Library of Congress. I haven't investigated them since I'm not so interested in her. But there's volumes of her letters and diaries and writings with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, I mean, volume, three big fat volumes of published materials. So mm. she didn't burn it, you know, and people had letters from her mm. out in the world that she didn't manage to burn, but she did, mm. she did burn a lot. Yes. Angelica, we loved it. <laughs> right. Thank you. In all that, all those years of, uh, of research, what was the biggest personal surprise you had? So the question is, in all the years of research, what was the biggest prize you, you came across? And by the way, he loved the book. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest surprise, I, again, I go back to that, that resistance made her stronger. I mean, that's just such a lesson to me. I wish I could believe that for myself and, <laughs> and act on it and not have hurt feelings when I get a bad book review. <laughs> um, so that was it. Um, I'll just, I'll tell you my, one of my, your favorite story is the cattle barge and the protest at the Statue of Liberty. I like the story about how um, Matilda was home one night, one day in Chicago and her grandson, I think it was Rob, was a boy, rode his bicycle. At this time you could ride right out of Chicago into the country. He rode out into the country and he got some garter snakes and he wrapped them up in a handkerchief <laughs> And he came home with this treasure of his garter snakes. And he said his mother wasn't home, but Matilda was upstairs in her bedroom. I think she was sitting in a chair. And he said, look, Grandma, look what I've got. And she <laughs> thought it was going to be like pretty rocks or yeah. <laughs> flowers. <laughs> he put the snakes in her lap, OK? <laughs> and he didn't die right there on the spot, you know? <laughs> and she didn't have a heart attack or anything. And she, he, she, he said, Grandma was not pleased. <laughs> <laughs> So I just love that yeah. story. <laughs> well, and there's just such an incredible human element, right? right. As, you, as you read the book and, and you start to hear these stories, they're logical choices that we may all make, right? We go help our family in another place or we go care for our kids uh, because we think it's the right thing to do. Um, and, you know, we're not looking 100 years down the line. Um, but, you know, I've let go of, you know, the, the bitterness or the challenge and, and you know, why my great-great-grandmother is not 
you know, at the table. She's it, getting there. She's getting there, but you know what? I, what we got in replace, uh, in lieu of that, was that she got a, a son-in-law who wrote an incredible book. Mm -hmm. And that book has in our psyche, in everyone's psyche, for the last 100 years, 120 years, the fact that a woman can rule in Oz. And if the result of that is a woman who is the president of the United States, <laughs> thank God for that. Right? So uh, I want to say thank you so much oh, for coming. Yes, thank All right, you. Angelica's thank book, you. Get the Book, thank Born you. Criminal. Thank you. And the new Voice of Liberty yeah, that's coming. That uh, thank you so much oh, to the League of Women Voters. I actually have I actually have little gifts for you guys to thank you. So as is tradition for the league, we always have speaker thank gifts. So thank much. you. Thank you. Oh, and actually, since uh, since Gita and Karen are part of this as well, oh, thank you. you're welcome. Oh, and yes, buy a book. Get it signed. Yes, so on that Join note, the league. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we're, go uh, we're going to.